So this is a conversation with Zena Hashembeck. She's a poet originally from Tripoli, Lebanon. We spoke about her poems, of course, and about what it means to be thinking about Lebanon from outside of Lebanon. We touched upon mental health, struggling with poetry, and even sectarian jokes. We also mentioned our respective upbringings, her in Tripoli and myself in Mount Lebanon, and what they reveal about modern Lebanese politics. Oh, and just one thing, I had some technical difficulties recording this audio, so I uh, ended up using the file that I uh, recorded from the computer. So you may notice a decrease in audio quality, but hopefully not that much. So as usual, you can follow the podcast on Twitter at FireDeseTimes, and if you like what I do, please consider supporting this project with only $1 a month on Patreon or BuyMeCoffee.com, and you can also do so directly on PayPal if you prefer. Patreon is for monthly, PayPal is for one-offs, and BuyMeCoffee has both options. And if you cannot donate, you can still help by reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you. My name is Zena Hashembek, and I'm a Lebanese poet. So before starting our conversation, I will let Zena read her poem, Dear Brecht. Dear Brecht. Is it Brecht with a Kha? I'm tired of singing about the dark times. My country breaks me. I wanted to consider the walnut tree, but yesterday my hometown burnt. A young man dead, then undead. I will not use the word blooms with blood. His white shirt not a field. I listened to Sayyid Makkawi. I looked at videos of the streets. This is the corner where the bus dropped me. This is the roundabout of my first accident. This is where it hurts the most, in the gut. I shouted the news to my husband from one room to another. I don't want to hear it. He said, but is it possible to merely abandon the ache? Dear Brecht, perhaps you've heard about the virus. I've been staying home. I've been sanitizing. I've been doodling snails. I've been wearing masks. After two months of absence, my friend is coming over today. We will distance as we've been instructed. Her pain and my pain, 1.5 meters apart. The bougainvillea leaves on the grass. Last night, a young protester dead, then undead, then dead again this morning. His sister mourns him by stating facts. Martyr, brother, 26, shot by the army during the clashes with protesters. I will not use the word bougainvillea with blood. I don't smoke, except when my country burns. I guess this makes me a smoker. Reading history books distresses me. They either extinguish desire or rehearse the usual sorrow. Either way, it's brutal. Last night, five cigarettes in one phone call. How's your family? The inflation? The imaginary money in the bank? I miss you too. I miss you. Molotov, Molotov, Badal shama Molotov. The rioters sing as they burn the ATM instead of the candle Molotov. I want to touch my friends. All the women I know, know the work of hands, except for myself. My mother pulled the rope from the generator's side. My aunt kneaded the meat and burghul. My friend assembled a pool. I have patience only for words. I wanted so desperately for my daughters to grow. 
I prayed for breast milk, then prayed it stops. Don't believe what I tell you, I won't, about the child I did not have. The pain is in the gut. The pain is in the morning. My daughter divides and conjugates in the living room, cat ears on her head. The sleeplessness comes from the screen in my palm. The hunger revolution. The street is ours. My daughter raises her hand. She still believes in answers. She doesn't believe in God who sees everything. The channels don't broadcast the protests. They play Turkish soap operas. It's Ramadan after all. People want to eat and be entertained. I want to eat and be entertained. Why isn't there only one religion? My daughter asks. Hashtag المسلسلات أهم من الجوع. Hashtag TV series are more important than hunger. Dear Brecht, how many times will I have to write this poem? When my friend came over, we failed, we hugged. The body wants what it wants. Now I sound like a singer, but didn't you want me to sing? Once a lady applied eyebrow shadow for me. Once there was a pianist in a hospital lounge. Once I danced on the beach with hundreds of people. Perhaps in this life, it's always too soon to heal. Pencil, pencil, penicillin. My husband places a carnation behind my ear. The children's park is empty. I crushed a moth with my bare foot as I walked in the night garden, wasn't looking. The birds are too much, having sex in the trees. Dear Brecht, I'm waiting for the applause. There is no radio in the house. I switch on the radio. Yasqut kul shay. Down with everything. I went outside for a smoke, but there was the scent of jasmines. I sound composed because I'm gasoline. So let's start with the poem we just heard you recite. Where did it come from? Uh, you said that you initially had in mind a quote unquote uplifting poem, but then this came. Yeah. Um... The thing is, after, after the Thawra in Lebanon, I uh, really didn't have in mind any poems. And I, I'm, I'm talking in terms of both reading them and writing, like reading poems and writing poems. Okay. Uh, I couldn't tap into poetry. But I was working, uh, and I'm still working, on this uh, little poetry program for the BBC Four which we called, we titled Singing About the Dark Times, after Brecht's famous quote, which goes, and in the dark time, will there also be singing? Yes, there will be singing about the dark times. And the way we envisioned it is that I would interview poets and ask them how they process uh, through poetry. You know, uh, the dark times, whatever that means. It could be the pandemic, it could be a war, it could be any kind of public trauma, really. Yeah. And how you process it through poetry. And I was the one sort of telling the producers, like, it has to be uplifting. And on the fact that I'm Arab doesn't mean that it has to be about pain. <laughs> Oh, uh, all that shit, like I really pushed back, you know, like, no, they wanted to call it something else. I changed the title. Anyway, so an uplifting, uplifting, plus people are going through a pandemic, like they don't want, they probably don't want to listen to something that puts them down, right? Yeah. And I knew that I was also supposed to write a poem for this particular program. And I couldn't tap into poetry and I knew I had to write it. In the back of my mind, I thought, okay, maximum, I'll I'll, uh, I'll use an old poem. That was mm. fine. But I wanted to challenge myself and I wanted to write in the now. 
and I kind of forgot about it for a few weeks until uh, one morning I woke up after the the protesters were out in Tripoli one night in April. I don't know, it was maybe April 27. I'm talking mm. about the, uh, the morning of April 28. I'm not sure, late April, it was Ramadan. And, uh, you know, a lot of banks were sort of burnt or whatever. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, I woke up to the news that uh, Fawaz al-Saman was dead. And that was it for me. Like it was building, building, building. Like we know that how like what we call wave one of the revolution was uh, a high, uh, something festive, uh, mm -hmm. joyful. And we were deep in like wave two, which is like pandemic, economic crisis, all of that. And I was feeling really generally very low. And then the news hit me and that poem just came. It just came and I was literally sitting because I mentioned my daughter like with cat ears on her uh, head and that was actually there like my daughter because the dining room table is now the classroom right yeah and so she was sitting across of me uh sort of raising her hand enthusiastically to her teacher wanting to answer something with cat ears on her head and there I was with this very heavy knowledge about Tripoli and about Lebanon and I was thinking about the pandemic and everything, and the poem just came. And uh, yeah, it's not uplifting. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's not not uplifting. Do you know? Like, it's not completely depressing either. But no, it's not. This is, you know, this is this is what came. This is what was true. I wasn't capable of singing or dancing or doing all that. I, I, this is, yeah. And it just came, and it almost came in one go. Like, uh, I started it uh, on that dining room table, and I was interrupted because we were studying, and I kept working uh, on it throughout the day. And that was it. That was the poem. The, the contrast is extraordinary between you reading the news and seeing what's happening back home, and your daughter just next to you with these uh, cat ears uh, asking yeah. about, like, what's happening. And... I will link it to um, the second question, which is I, I was going to ask you, I will ask you how have you lived your poetry since the Thawar, since the October Revolution? And mm -hmm. the reason why I will ask it is, uh, this is episode number 30 in, in, I don't know, it's been, it hasn't been that long, like a couple of months and a half. So I've been quote unquote very productive when it comes to the podcast, right? And yeah. <laughs> One of the, the, re the reason why I've been quote unquote so productive when it comes to the podcast is that I have been completely unable to write anything. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's been much easier for me to sort of process it by just talking about things than, than sitting down and writing because I would be very, very paralyzed. There's something very um, paralyzing about everything being on the same screen. So yes, there was, there's some webinars that I had to follow. My work is online. Uh, Twitter is online. The podcast yeah. is online. Every, I'm talking to the exact same screen all the time. And yes. <laughs> there's yes. something very odd about then, well, turning quote unquote that off, but then when you need to turn it on again, it's still the same screen. And yeah. that's, that's been, so that's been one of my issues. And now I'm recently getting back into it shui shui slowly, but it's, it hasn't gotten uh, to a, let's say, healthy level yet. So mm. with that in mind, how have you lived your poetry uh, or poetry in general? since uh, October 2019? Yeah, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for being very productive for, uh, <laughs> on the, the fire these times because I've been really enjoying listening. Uh, it's That's been good. one of the things that uh, I've, you know, on the receiving end, I've enjoyed listening to many of these episodes. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure all of this will sort of eventually uh, organically feed into your writing somehow. I think we need to process, you know, when we are faced with such a colossal event, you know, uh, I didn't see it coming. I don't know if no one saw it coming, but I didn't see it coming at all. No. And, and there it was on October 17, my God, there was, there was like a revolution happening. And so for me, it was a complete, I called it first, I called it to myself because, you know, I talk to myself a lot. So I called it, <laughs> To, I called it, it's a divorce from poetry. Like I've been, I've divorced poetry. Yeah. Uh, now I'm thinking of it more as a separation because I know in my heart of hearts that th this is why I'm a poet and this is how I process the world. And I will 
you know, it will somehow feed into my poetry again, one way or the other, like what you were saying about, about your essays. So I could not process through a poem. A lot of my friends were like, are you going to write a poem about the revolution? Like even through the high, the high, like the high phase, you know, like, are you going to write a poem about the revolution? And I, I didn't feel like writing a poem and I didn't want to write a poem. And I think part of me did not want to put the revolution in a poem. Maybe later, but not now, not as I was feeling it. Mm. And to be honest, I did end up writing a poem about phase one other than the Dear Brecht one, which is... Mm about phase two, but I was all, also, I, I wrote it because I was asked, like I was specifically asked for uh, a project to write this poem. And so I had to like sit my ass down and write it. Otherwise I wouldn't have. So, and it wasn't just in terms of writing because my poetry writing always comes in waves anyways. Like I'm not constantly writing poetry, but in terms of reading, uh, I usually almost only read poetry. I couldn't tap into poems. Like I'd open a poem on my screens and I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I'd read it, reread it, didn't get it, just didn't, wasn't there. So there I was completely consuming the news all the time, yeah. uh, whether it's on my phone or like our TV is rarely like on in our house. So the TV was always on, you know, I turned into my dad all of a sudden uh, with the TV on and the news because the news was something I really hated growing up you know, as a little sure. girl. Uh, I, I, I still remember, I mean, there's, there's a decade between us, so I don't know if you remember the exact tune, but I still remember the news tune of LBC. Do you remember it? Yeah, I do, I do, I do. Da, 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 <laughs> do you remember it? I do. And it, it, I hated it. I hated it because every day at eight, we were all shushed, like shush. We want to listen to the news and we felt kids feel the energy. We felt the energy shift and everyone's, and even as a little kid, I felt that the language of the news did not interest me. It simply didn't interest me. It was dull. It was repetitive. And even if I didn't know the content, I knew, oh, well, there's no change happening. Yeah. With the Thoda, perhaps for the first time in my life, I felt like there might be a change happening. So I'm going to listen to the news, you know, uh, from different, like, not just like the, 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 the local news, but, you know, on, also on social media. And my kids, my kids were like, mama, please turn it off. Mama, what's wrong with you? Mama, you look sad. Like they pick up, they pick up on this shit, you know? Yeah. So I was consuming the news and I couldn't uh, write poetry, but it's not that I wasn't writing at all either, either because I turned to prose. So my day went from like consuming, consuming, consuming the news to like sitting down either at the end of the day or the next day in the morning and writing down like journal entries every day and it didn't last very long because i cracked in the end because what was happening is that i was outside of lebanon physically mm -hmm. but mentally i was there and so mentally i was completely not present for my kids i was completely not present for marwan i was completely not present for for my friends and it, it was, yeah, I, I cracked in the end. I couldn't. I couldn't go on uh, mentally living in one place and physically living in another. But I did, uh, I, I processed as much as I could through these journal entries. And I actually wanted to ask you about that because I, I saw on Twitter that you were journaling yeah, lately. And that there's a whole like online culture about journaling. Yeah, it's a whole thing, yeah. Could you, could you tell me a little bit about um, that? Like your... So the the journaling community i wouldn't say i'm like super active in it i just mainly follow some of the tips and advices that some people uh, have it's usually like youtubers and stuff and mm -hmm. there are just many methods and what i got really interested in is the visual aspect of it so rather than just writing your thoughts down which is very important honestly like i i would recommend anyone to just keep a diary and write things down even some of my entries if you read them they're, they're boring as fuck like there's nothing happening <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i literally say well today i i cooked this and then i went on a walk and then i sat down on the balcony and i enjoyed the view that's that's like a diary entry yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so one of those journal uh the, especially the bullet journals they would have sort of like stylistic stuff they would actually spend a lot a lot of time like hours and hours designing a certain if they're thinking of i don't know uh they want to think of uh there was one that really uh, struck me last week she said something along the lines of like she has this thing like a safe space whenever she thinks of a safe space because her uh in her she didn't share too much but i guess that in her actuality it's 
something's happening. So maybe like she doesn't feel safe where she lives or whatever. And mm -hmm. so she th she was saying that when she thinks of the safe space, she thinks of a shire like area, like in the Lord of the Rings. And that's something that that resonates with me because I'm 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 a fan of that world. And so mm -hmm. she would she literally drew a door, you know, like the Hobbit hole and everything like that. And in mm -hmm. it, she she just wrote the entry of the day. And the entry of the day is pretty mild as well. Like it's not like a poem or. Uh, some citation that she found online. No, no, it's, it's just like today I woke up, I did this, I did this. But it's like she was mentally linking it to this happier place in a sense that she would mm. want to be in. And that sort of at least uplifted her, I guess, for, for the moment. And so that, mm. that's, that's what I've, I've been uh, getting at. But this actually like it, it uh, brings me in a sense to, I wanted to add, you mentioned that you were writing prose instead of poetry at some point. What is the difference between the two for those who don't know? And mm. um, why would one sort of fit a certain mood better than the other one? And, you know, why would the other one mm. then fit in a different mood and so on? Yeah. Um, I want to comment on the visual aspect before yes. I answer your yeah. question. It's interesting because when I was revisiting my Thauda notes uh, for the first time, I found myself on the side, like as I was sort of like looking through these entries, maybe revising stuff, uh, also sort of like, I, I don't know how to draw for the life of me, honestly, I suck at it. But <laughs> I found myself like, you know, uh, drawing stuff from Lebanon, like drawing, like uh, drawing the egg, you know, like how yeah, does like the egg look like? Thing. Yeah, let me, let me draw. So I, th there's, it's interesting. I don't know what the link is, but it's interesting that you mentioned that. Mm. Uh, and for me, it's the entire opposite. It's not the Shire. It's not a happy place. Mm -hmm. For me, poetry writing has a lot of joy in it. And prose is utterly devoid of joy. Mm. Uh, I don't know why. I mean, I tried to analyze it. So when I'm writing poetry, how can I say this? When I'm writing poetry, even when it's about something difficult. And I've written about like this, this the Dear Brecht poem, right? It's a difficult poem to mm. process. But when I'm writing it and right after I finish writing it and when I come back and revise it, there's a joy in the process. I feel joy. I feel like writing poetry has always been to me a kind of tapping into this deep well of knowledge that I have inside me. It's knowledge. It's not, it's not analytical thinking. All right. It's just something, you know, all right. And, uh, and I'm, I'm saying knowledge and not feeling, because if I'm going to say feeling, people are going to interpret it as if, oh, yeah, poetry is about feeling and then prose is about thinking. But I don't mean that. Uh, I mean this, this deep knowledge uh, that is almost magical. And that I've always felt. And I've been reading an essay, essays by Audre Lorde, by the way. And in one of her essays, she talks about that. She talks about poetry versus prose. And I felt so seen. Like that book that I'm reading by Audre Lorde, it's so weird how there are books that are perfect for your state of mind right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt so seen because she said the exact same. Like she said, yeah, poetry is about knowledge, whereas prose... Uh, is about uh, analyzing, you know, I'm, and, and she said many things too. I don't want to paraphrase her in the wrong way. I'm going to say how it feels like to me. Mm -hmm. So it feels like there's some, something almost magical, transcendental, and I mean it, magic, magic. It's like you take language and you sort of, you make the best out of it. You know, this is the language that the news uses, right? It's, it's the same tool, right? But you're taking it and you're making something magical with it and you don't know what it is you just read it out loud you read it to your friends you read it to an audience and they go ah oh, yeah you know and so there's a joy in it even when you're talking about sad stuff there's a joy in it mm -hmm. and I couldn't tap into that joy uh, I couldn't tap into that and I went to nonfiction, just following a, a hunch just a hunch I went into uh, journaling and I believe in following hunches and every day I sat down and I did not want to write and I did not want to process through prose. And I think it's because prose probably, uh, I was facing my repeated disappointments. I was facing a lot of things that uh, 
it's not that I wasn't writing about them in poetry because I've been writing about my relationship to Lebanon in poetry for a long time now, but it's a different space that you tap into. When, you're, when I tapped to it into, in terms of journaling, it was like, uh, yeah, you really, you really come face to face with, with this, these feelings and you have to now analyze them and kind of dig deeper. And that's painful, you know, that's painful. And it didn't have any joy in it. And someone recently asked me, well, why did you do it if it didn't have any joy in it? And I think it's because for me, it was, it still felt like a work of love. And I used to say that my relationship with Lebanon is a love-hate relationship. Mm -hmm. And after writing all these notes, I sort of came to the conclusion that no, it's a love-love relationship. And this is what love looks like. It's a difficult, difficult thing. It's, uh, and, and sometimes there's no joy in it, but, but there's still love in there. And uh, I don't know if I'm making any sense or rambling. Yeah, you are, you are. And, and yeah, yeah. So that's, that's how poetry versus prose feels like to me. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I might change my mind uh, later on, looking back at these notes, but yeah. And so just on the, on the visual aspect of it, one reason why I think it's been so important for me to, for example, one thing that I do from time to time is I would, I have this very, very long Twitter thread that I started the, like on October 17th and it went on for, I think over two months and it's just one long Twitter thread. So I did that for, documentation purposes as in like this is useful for other people and journalists and whatever but I also just did it for myself because yes. I knew that uh, it was October and at the time I was in this weird transition phase I, I, I was already doing my PhD but I had left Scotland and now I'm in Switzerland so I was in between mm. and due to the visa the usual visa crap I had to be in Lebanon to apply for the, for the, for the new visa and so yeah. it just happened that I was in Lebanon during the revolution essentially Mm. And I mm. knew that eventually I would have to come to Switzerland to continue the PhD. So I knew that mm. there was this transition phase and that my priority back then was to just take in as much as possible, document mm. as much as possible, because mm. I knew that soon enough I'm going to have to sit with all of that and try and do something with it. And the podcast, mm. the writing, you know, that, that's part of it. And mm. the visual aspect is that if I can use the example of the egg. And for those who don't know, the egg is this like old, uh, what was it, like an opera house, uh, cinema, I think at some I point. I think cinema, well. yeah. It was meant to yeah. be a cinema. Yeah. It was meant to be a cinema. And then it just died. Like it, it, was, it was never, it was partly destroyed during the war. Then it was never really opened uh, again. I think briefly in the 90s, they opened it for some events, but not, not fully. And yeah, it's weird. My mother-in-law has this memory of her shopping for shoes in the egg. And I kept interrogating her about this. Are you sure, Tante? Are you sure? She's like, yes, I am very sure. I don't know if that's like faulty memory or what. But yeah, yeah, sorry. I, have, I, I have, interrupted you. Yes. No, no, no. I, because this whole area, you know, downtown, Balad, uh, historically, it, there is this weird, it's a space that's very weird. It's like, it's the yes. four, <laughs> <laughs> temporally odd like we don't really know if it's in the past it's in the present and the future there's like many things happening at the same time and it's not mm. a coincidence that that's where people went to reclaim the space and everything obviously so mm. when i mm. when i went into the egg for the first time which was mm. like soon after the next day or something like it was a late uh, october 20 21 something like that mm. um i don't know how to describe the feeling i don't know how to tell you how weird it was like for me the the it wasn't like I entered in, it's like ecstasy and joy and everything. I entered yeah. and the, I just felt like the heaviness of it. Like mm. this is, this is an unusual situation. Let's put it very simply. This yeah. is unusual. It's good. It's good that it's happening, but it's yeah. unusual. And because it's unusual, mm. you don't know how it will end. You don't know if we will manage to just open it up and turn it into something. We don't know if, you know, at some point we might get tired or something might happen. You know, there was this, mm. this uh, uncertainty, I, sh I should say, around it. And mm. what happened after that is that, uh, so I came back here, of course, and the pandemic hits. Within two weeks uh, yeah. after landing, <laughs> the pandemic hits. And it didn't matter that I was in Switzerland because everyone was in those anyway. Yeah, and yeah. 
uh, this is so this is part of why I ended up doing this whole you can think of the podcast as kind of like a processing diary kind of thing and mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you you meant you did mention it a bit but like let, let's get into it a bit more of how it felt like for you to be outside of Lebanon why Lebanon was so present in your mind this whole the experience that you just mentioned of being mm. physically in one place and but mentally in another i mean this mm. this is something that i actually had to actively uh do something about because i was completely losing control of my own mind and yes yes <laughs> i was like talking with some friends who are worried about the future I have two close friends who got married recently and it it had to be live streamed for those of us who are abroad and it was this entire experience of well, you know, I was with them and I'm in my pajamas and then, okay, well, <laughs> now logging off, guys, see you. And then I'm still where I am, you know, it's the same space. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, I wanted to ask you a bit about, uh, if you can talk a bit more about that experience of witnessing the revolution. I, if I'm not mistaken, you you briefly went, or I don't actually remember, so just feel free to talk about it. Yeah. And how okay. it meant then to leave and, you know, seeing all of that. And then recently with Wave 2.0, Talk a bit more mm -hmm. about what that was, especially because uh, after after you answer, I want to get into more into Tripoli specifically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh God. Uh, it's a, I mean, where do I start? So when the revolution on October seventeenth, I was in London. I was performing, uh, and I went backstage, and I opened uh, WhatsApp, and my brother-in-law uh, was like, "Well, Anne bil tune into LB, tune into LBC, Thawra." And I find it really beautiful that from that first moment, well, some people some people had had named it Thora, like from like my brother-in-law had sent Thora, you know, without any like uh, processing of it uh, really. And I know that some people are going to say, no, this is not a Thora; it's just an uprising, and uh, you know they might be right from like an analytical point of view, but I don't give a shit. Emotionally, it was a Thora for me. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I, I started screaming backstage. It was, it was such a funny moment because you, you just mentioned being in your pajamas. I was in London at the South Bank Center surrounded by like singers and poets. I think all of whom have never been to Lebanon before. And I was like, oh my God, there's a soda in Lebanon. And everyone's like sort of staring at this, like what, what was happening? And I opened Twitter and I started showing everyone like, look, 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 look what's happening. And I didn't know what was happening. It was just processing. Hmm. Right. And then, you know, I went, you know, I finished the show. I went on a walk with uh, my Jordanian friend who had just moved from Dubai to London. And we sort of just processed it together. Like, what do you think would happen? Oh, my God. Will, will they come for the people in the street? Will they crack down on them? Will they, you know, will they beat them up? Will they, you know, what, what will happen? And I was kind of worried, but excited. And then events started unfolding, unfolding, unfolding. And uh, it was a mixture of feelings for me. It was like, I know that for, for my friends on the streets, it was a high. Yeah. For me, it was simultaneously a high and a low. Yeah. So I was, I was very much happy and ecstatic seeing what was happening on the street, while at the same time very aware that I was only witnessing it through a screen. Uh, so I, I felt sad about that. And it... It wasn't like, uh, yeah, it was. It wasn't just like a nostalgia kind of sad. Like it wasn't. It wasn't a sadness of like, oh, I want to go back to Lebanon. Kind of sad because I'm still not sure if I want to go back to Lebanon. I think yes, but I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, it was a kind of why I I want to be there. I just genuinely want to be there for that moment because I think I'm one of. I think you can be many things as a Lebanese. You can be a Lebanese in Lebanon, completely dissociated from anything. Perfect. You can be a Lebanese outside of Lebanon, also dissociated. Mm -hmm. You can be outside of Lebanon, but very much, you know, still feel that link. And I'm not talking about patriotism. I'm just thinking that emotional link with, yeah, with yeah. your country. Uh, and you can be inside it and have that link. So I'm, I fall into the category of I left, but I feel like I've never left. And so I wanted my body to be where my mind was and I couldn't and uh, I was sad. And uh, so it was a, this roller coaster of, of emotion uh, that I'm still feeling. And, you know, you mentioned the transition and 
uh, I've been feeling a shift, not just not just in terms of my reaction to the thawra, but my whole life has been in my mind and my body have been shifting. I don't know where. And that might be part of why I'm, I'm just contemplating and not writing a lot right now. Uh, my body has been shifting. So in my, in my body, there's been a shift from apparent health to apparent sickness. In, in Lebanon, there's a shift because of the thawra. In the world, there's a shift because of the pandemic. In my writing, there was a shift from poetry to prose. In my reading, there's a shift from reading only poetry to reading more history and essays. Uh, in my psyche, I remember right before the pandemic, I hit a period where I told my close friends, Khalas, uh, I need therapy. I think I need to see, like I have, I've never done therapy before. And right before the pandemic, uh, I was talking to some close friends and they said, yeah, I, we think, we think, yeah, you should do that. Uh, and then the pandemic hit and I couldn't do that. Um, and so there's this whole, yeah, I, I don't know if it's making sense to you, a whole yeah, shift, yeah. you know, that's, that's, that's been happening. I don't know how to process it. And I blame you for, for the reading, by the way. I blame <laughs> you for the reading. Because for, you know, for those of you who don't know, Joey, for the longest time was championing Andrew Arsan's book, yes. uh, a four, four, five hundred page book, you know, very slim book <laughs> uh, about Lebanon called Lebanon, a country in fragments. And I decided to uh, read it. I decided to read it. Uh, it wasn't it was somehow the right time to read it and the wrong time to read it. <laughs> Uh, because it's a brilliant book, it's an excellent book, but it's a very depressing book if you're Lebanese, because all the all all that the book is doing is sort of holding up this mirror, and showing you your disappointments, and showing you your grief, and showing you your traumas. And for those of us who leave, at least for me, I'm not going to talk actually in the we. I'm going to talk in the I. Mm -hmm. I left, and I never really processed it. It's been, I left in 2006 and I keep coming back, of course, you know, always, but I never really processed that I left because in my mind, no, I haven't left. I didn't leave. Yeah. That book kind of made me process everything. It's, it's weird. And I don't know if you consider yourself part of the, the diaspora, but like a journalist was speaking to me. Uh, right, right when the Lebanese revolution was starting and, and she began her question like as a writer from of the Lebanese diaspora and I was very shocked and I said, I, I don't consider myself a writer of the diaspora. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm a Lebanese writer. Like for me, and my, not, not that being a writer of the diaspora is bad, you know, not no, that no, it's no. a bad thing. It's just that I don't define myself this way. Like uh, I didn't grow up in Brazil or Australia or the US and like maybe, you know, like I have cousins in Australia, right? That visit uh, Lebanon from time to time. And like, I grew up there. I grew up there all, you know, most of my life and I left and I keep returning. So I'm not a part of the diaspora. And then I went, I had this, and I had this conversation with my Syrian uh, friend. I told him, you know, Hani, you know, do you think you're a part of the Syrian diaspora? He said, no. You know, so I had the same reaction. And I wonder, do you, do you have that reaction? Like, do you consider yourself? I don't so, know. So what's uh, funny is that I think I'm, I, this was a topic of conversation that came up with Andrew Arsene when I had him on. Uh, and so for those who don't know, there is an episode with Andrew Arsene in which we, we did speak about the book. I'll, I'll, mm. I mean, it's, it's on the website, but I'll link it in the blog post. The answer is not really. Um, I, I, like for me, the diaspora means something very specific. And there's something a bit permanent about it that I don't feel um, represents my experience as, as well. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I left in 2015. I mean, this for those who have list, listened to previous episodes, this will sound boring and repetitive, but I left in 2015 uh, with no intention of uh, really leaving. I was just, it was just a one year master's thing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. It's uh, like halfway through that, it was, it was in London at SOAS, uh, halfway through that, it's, it's when I started having doubts about whether it would make sense for me to go back. Mm, and mm. in the end, I did go back. Uh, Visa said so, <laughs> so I did go back. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and then, so, it, so part of it was just a necessity because I was following a specific academic route and it was taking me to first London, yeah. then Edinburgh, and now, now Geneva. Mm. 
So that was kind of an obligation to it in a sense. And the other part of it is that I did feel very strongly a, a very contradictory, I should say. Like it was, it was never one feeling. There was a bunch of feelings at the same time, but the one of that one of those feelings that that ended up sort of taking over was that I need some time. I need mm-hmm. some time mm-hmm. in a space that is not my own, and my own here is defined as Lebanon, and mm-hmm. most specifically, I think to be more accurate and honest about it, it's like Mount Lebanon and Beirut. Those are my two regions that I'm more familiar, most familiar with. Yeah, 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 makes sense. And, yes. Um, I I needed some time outside of that space to try and figure out what it meant for me. And I wouldn't say that I'm at the, like, I wouldn't say that that process has truly ended. Not at all, actually. I think I'm still there, just probably at the later stage or like slightly more developed than it was five years ago. But- And you, yeah, you can never know. You, yeah, I mean, like there's no way- No, th- there's- Sorry, I, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I envy people. I truly, truly envy people. Not in like a, jealous kind of like I will now sit con and you will die kind of way but but, uh, but I do I, it's it's baffling to me people who come up to me and they have a plan mm. they're like they're like so we are now in Dubai right yes. but we know that in five years we're going to end up in California and we're going to yes. or we're going to buy a house and whatever and this is what we're going to do because I am very frustrated at the fact that what you said, you were following, like, it's just like, it's like you were making it up as you go, right? You yeah, were following yeah, this academic. Pretty much, pretty much. It's the same f- thing for me. I wasn't following an academic route, but I was just like, Marwan and I got married mm-hmm. and then he found a job in Saudi. Then I followed mm-hmm. him. Mm-hmm. Then we went to Bahrain. Then mm-hmm. I, we are here in Dubai. And I never ever felt in, at home in, ba- in Bahrain or in Saudi at all. I feel more at home in Dubai because of mm-hmm. the people, because I think people are homes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, there's a weekly conversation that I, ha- I call it, like I call it the weekly conversation that I either have with Marwan or my friends or both the Lebanese friends of like, so where do you think we will end up? And it's a conversation that's absolutely useless. It's useless because it leads nowhere. It's like we're turning in circles. We're, I'm talking to him. So do you think maybe France, and, and you know, if you hear us, it's like we have, I mean, we have options, but we can get up and go to, you know, like if we have, as if we have the goddamn luxury, you know? Yeah. And, but we still say it. France, the other day I was talking to my friend, she was like, my Palestinian friend, she was like, maybe Berlin, you know? <laughs> We contemplate, but none of it is real. My my husband has the American passport and my daughters do. I don't. Mm. And he's like, how about the US? You know, and you have a poetry career that can, you know, that can be good. And But I don't see myself at all in the US, to be mm. honest. And it's too far for me. Mm. And so the re- really by elimination, the only option that's left is to go back to Lebanon, <laughs> you know? And, uh, but how? But then how? And also Dubai is so transient, uh, Joey. It's, it's yeah. like the, the, the people who are in Paris, at least like they can stay there, like they can feel that they can't, possibly they're not spit out the minute they don't have a job. Yeah. But for Dubai, it's like you're here, you have a, a residency if you have a job. So, you know, uh, God forbid if the minute my husband, for example, loses the job, we have a month. Either you find another job or you go out, you get out. Mm-hmm. Or maybe you do the whole visa thing where you like go to Oman, stamp a one month visa, visa, come back, but then you have to have the, like, the economic means to do so. Yeah. And usually uh, those of us who live in Dubai, I mean, I speak for myself, it's, it's also a day by day thing. It's also like, it's not like we don't have money on the side. We yeah. just, we live a comfortable life, but it's a comfortable life as, as, as long as the salary comes in. Once the salary is out, we are completely screwed. And then we have to leave the country. Mm-hmm. So we feel, we, you, know, you know, I felt, you know, you feel spit out by Lebanon because there's not enough room, yes. you know, for you to develop. And then I feel like any, any day now, Dubai can spit me out. Mm-hmm. And so hence... Hence, I have this constant conversation because I'm always like bracing myself, you know, of like, where could I go? And, and, and that's why I envy people who have more stability in their life and who could genuinely say like, in five years, I'm going to be in, you know, yeah. in, in the States or go back to France or, you know, uh, 
yeah, it's it's difficult. Uh, but it maybe is. also it's it's a creative like it's it's generative. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. What's your it what's do, your... it does have like I would say that the particular experience that I've had in the past five years has definitely allowed me to connect with people who have similar enough experiences. It doesn't have to be the exact same one, of course, but like some enough similarities between us that there's an immediate bond. So in recent months, uh, just recently, I, I mean, just uh, a few days ago, I, I, I published uh, uh, this essay. It's not really an essay. It's kind of more like a conversation that I had with people from Lausanne, which is this uh, Hong Kong collective. And mm -hmm. uh, what I connected with, uh, what, with one person at first and then with other groups in, in, the, in the collective and in the, in the media outlet is this whole notion of transience because Hong Kong, you know, um, was a British colony, then was literally basically handed over to China in 97. And there are these people that are like, there are people who are in, from pre-97 who some of them have the, a specific British passport, others don't and others who I, some identify more as Chinese, some uh, increasingly, especially with the youth, they identify more as, as Hong Kongers, primarily mm -hmm. neither British nor Chinese. And there is this expiry date when it comes to Hong Kong. I've been calling it an expiry date. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much what it is, like it, 2047. That is the specific date that was the handover to China. 50 years is the, the two system, one, one country, two system model. After that, mm. then the integration towards China is supposed to, like that's supposed to be the process, although they would say it's happening much faster now. So anyway, mm. the, the, the thing that I connected with them is having this feeling of an expiry date. In their case, it's, it's literal, like there is, like they, it's literally written yeah. 2047, that's the date. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, with, yeah. with us, it's, uh, well, we don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow in that sense, that kind of expiry date. It's more of yeah. an ant anticipation and there's a book called The Anticipation of Violence, whatever it's called. This is the academic term for it in Lebanon. And Ah, oh, okay. No, okay, good to know. Okay. All it means is that it's as it sounds. It's that yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we live we live our lives with an anticipation of violence. And there's this anecdote I'll, I'll, uh, which really marked me when I when I listened to it. And he was mentioning the story of um, he was meeting someone and that someone uh, was a politician. And so there was some it was there was some event happening in Lebanon. And mm -hmm. with uh, some clashes, I don't, I don't think it was 2008. I think it was something much smaller than that. And mm -hmm. so some tension, some whatever. And then suddenly the bodyguard of that politician immediately mm -hmm. ran out to the, to the roof, to the rooftop with his gun and uh, basically was muttering to himself almost like, I think something along the, it, he wrote it in English, but oh, I can that's imagine. that's in Andrew's book. That's in Andrew's book. Oh, that book. was Andrew's book. Okay, I was- Yes, I was... yeah, oh my God, that was, that gave me the chills. Yes, exactly. continue, please, yes, continue exactly. describing. So it's, he was saying something along, so like, they're coming, they're coming, which I, I can yes. imagine he was saying it in Arabic, like, Jain, Jain, basically. Yeah, 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 he, he prepared himself to like, be on the attack. He prepared himself oh for a God. war, immediately yeah, prepared yeah. himself for a war. Yeah. And that, that's something like, uh, it's very symbolic. And then, you know, uh, he went down and then uh, I guess Andrew then spoke to, I think it was the wife of the guy. The, the wife, wife, yes. Yeah, who said like, uh, haram, like this guy is, uh, you uh, know, haram, haram. Like, he's tired mm. or he's sick or he's whatever. Mm. But like what she was describing is PTSD. Like this guy has PTSD. This is, it's, yeah. a, te it's a textbook case of PTSD. It's actually yes. one of the worst forms of it. Like to actually be physically ready to go on the fight. That's pretty extreme. Yeah, um, my God, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, we, we, we have the different, we, we are the, the younger generation, so we have a different kind of, I think it's... Um, we inherited it. We don't have the yeah. same one. It, it, yeah. uh, it's like... Yeah, we inherited, yeah. Secondhand trauma or secondhand memory or secondhand... Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, there are all of these terms. And, and, I think, and I think that's why I've been like, that's one of the reasons, I have many reasons, but some of them are personal. One of the reasons why I, I wanted to go into, like to do some therapy because uh -huh. the Thaura made me realize, have conversations like the ones we're having now mm -hmm. and read, read books like Andrew's book. Mm -hmm. that yeah that kind of like brought up and i and i wanted to see like what have i what i have inherited maybe mm -hmm. and what you know but, but not just politically but also on, on like a personal level uh, a family level and and all of that Absolutely. but uh, yeah and i also want to add that that i also wanted to leave lebanon mm -hmm. 
Like I wanted, like, I don't know if I really, really wanted to, but like, I would imagine that I am the kind of person who would want to be exposed to as many uh, countries and cultures. Like, I like that, you know? Uh, I genuinely like that. Uh, so it's not that I, that I don't want to leave. It's just that I, I want to have like the, maybe the possibility to return because uh, in my head, I want to return. It's in my head, it only makes sense to return there. I mean, where else, you know? Mm -hmm. But as you said, life might like take you different places and that we might both be like, I, I might be, you know, 70 and you're 60 and you're, I don't know where we are. We should have that conversation older. <laughs> so, so a part of me wanted to leave Tripoli to go to Beirut. I couldn't wait. And a part of me wanted to leave uh, Lebanon, uh, but also a part of me is is mad at the fact that no one told me that when you're young, you have so many possibilities. Mm -hmm. Like when you, you don't even, you, we didn't even have kids. We didn't like, why didn't we go elsewhere? I don't know. And it's just like, yeah, it's just, you follow these series of coincidences that lead you places. It's, it's weird. It's never intentional. Mm -hmm. Whereas with some people, I feel that it's in more intentional and maybe it's better that it's not intentional. I don't know, but it's good to have some sense of security, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, so on the question of diaspora, actually, just reminded me. Um, so I wouldn't, uh, as I said, like, I don't think we would call ourselves diaspora, but mm -hmm. most of the Lebanese who grew up in Lebanon and then right now who are listening are elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, most of, statistically speaking, most of them are in countries that already have some kind of Lebanese presence. And so mm. there, there, there are these diaspora routes, if you want. The UAE is a yes. bit different because of this transient nature that you mentioned. But mm -hmm. for, for other people, it would be like the UK, the US, Brazil, Argentina, you know, France, France, yeah. Switzerland. Yeah. Uh, those tend to be ma most of the countries. And there's a reason for that, is that at some point there are established routes and it's it, it, like most diasporas function this way, essentially. There's a reason why there are so many, you know, uh, Japanese Americans instead of Japanese Indians. I'm making shit up, but like there are these these uh, yeah. diaspora <laughs> links that yeah, yeah, yeah. that end up making some kind of sense. Obviously, uh, mm. this you mentioned Tripoli to Beirut, and I definitely have experienced this um, from where I am in Mount Lebanon, and because I, then I lived in Beirut, and then I went back to Mount Lebanon before moving to London and so on. And mm. when I think of going back to Lebanon if I ever do go back to Lebanon, I actually don't know where I would physically land in the sense of oh, whether, God, whether it yeah. be Beirut or whether it would be uh, Mount Lebanon, uh, or maybe yeah. elsewhere, like who, who the fuck knows? Like maybe elsewhere in Lebanon yeah. at this point, I don't know. But yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree with that. I think, I think for me, it would probably be Beirut, but, but maybe, maybe not. May, I don't know. I don't know. No. Yeah. But so on Tripoli, I wanted, part of why I wanted to also talk to you is Tripoli has had a sort of a roller coaster in itself of, um, <laughs> of I don't know, of reputation, of of uh, emotions, of um, uh, scapegoating. A lot of scapegoating going on uh, from mm -hmm. by the Lebanese government, and uh, let's face it, quite a lot of Lebanese themselves. Yes, uh, I have a lot to say about that. Yes, and we'll get into that. And mm -hmm. so to contextualize it a bit for other people. Um, so the October Revolution happened, October 17. Tripoli soon became a sort of a de facto quote-unquote leader in the sense of the protest movement over there in Sahat al nur had mm -hmm. a, um, it felt anyway, I, I went up only twice myself, uh, but it did feel like there was a different kind of momentum than was happening in, in Beirut. In Beirut, mm -hmm. we were, um, uh, well, I mean, it was very similar as well, not, not, to, not so that people mis, mis, uh, misunderstand what I'm saying. But there was a more a more consistent, especially in the first few weeks, more consistent high numbers, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Even when the Beirut, like, so I, I remember some nights, like, there weren't many people on the streets in, uh, like, Sehta al Shuhada. Exactly. And then they would see, they would see that actually be Sehta Noor, there are people, and then that would sort of incite them. And then they would, you know, I remember, like, some kind of this dynamic happening uh, exactly. at times. And this yeah. was surprising. Not su I mean... In retrospect, it's not surprising given what we know, but mm -hmm. in, in, uh, at the time for many Lebanese, I will just, I will, I will try and be as objective as I can here because of yeah, the reactions yeah. that we've been seeing online. Uh, there was lots of people saying, well, Tripoli should become the capital of Lebanon or 
Tripoli uh, people from Tripoli are the best and there oh, was this sake. there was this um yeah. uh, like it's almost like we went the other extreme now we're trying to romanticize Tripoli. terrible <laughs> terrible <laughs> terrible of, terrible uh, we yes. went from scapegoating it to just romanticizing it instead yes. of just well you know this is a city <laughs> <laughs> this is the city. It has a pros and cons. People there, some are good, some are bad. Some people are doing yeah, good stuff. Yeah. Other people, are, you know, it's all of these things at the same time. <laughs> so yeah, I just wanted to to kind of get uh, your take on it, and so to so to speak, as someone who's actually from there. Oh my God, uh, this is going to be a long answer, by the way. <laughs> go uh, for it. I I apologize. I apologize if we're gonna go over time. If there's that's like a fine, time that's limit, fine. there is no time limit. Th- there are two. There are two uh, halves to your question. A is how Tripoli is, was scapegoated, mm-hmm. and B is after the revolution, what happened. I'm going to start with A, as someone from Tripoli. So yes, I couldn't wait to leave Tripoli because I just wanted to be sort of anonymous and invisible and do whatever the fuck I wanted in Beirut when I was 18. And uh, Tripoli is a city, but it sort of feels like a village. Mm. So everyone knows everyone and everyone's sort of gossiping. Mm. Yani the middle class could be terrible in terms of gossip. Uh, mm. Who did what? Who 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 wore what nail polish? I don't know. Not not everyone, of course. I'm not I'm not saying everyone in Tripoli is that. But it does feel like it has a, a village mentality to me. Yeah. Uh, whereas Beirut, for me at 18, meant uh, no this city, this vibrant, open city where I could just be invisible. I wanted right. to be invisible. You you know. So uh, that was it. But having said that, you know, moving to Beirut, uh, I remember, you know, I had, I, I, I no longer have the heavy Tripoli accent uh, uh, unless I talked with my, uh, I talk with my dad and brother specifically, I feel. Yeah. Oh, my mom came in. Hey. So when my husband and I are visiting my parents, I switch, I, like it's a different kind of accent than the accent I talk to him with. And he, Marwan goes like, Zena, what, 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 <laughs> why, <laughs> why, why are you speaking in this accent? It's a heavy accent, you know, uh, you know, like this is like, this is how I, uh, I revert to it. And so when I went at 18, went to Beirut, I was very much aware that I had an accent and kind of tried to hide it when, uh, when talking to people in Beirut, and that says something, that says something about how you think you you might be inferior, you know, in your accent. And um, that says something about how people view Tripoli. And definitely, uh, there's a lot of Lebanese people who view Tripoli as a very Muslim city, mm-hmm. as uh, I've heard so many times that, yeah, Tripoli is just part of Syria. And I don't know why the fuck that should be like uh, an insult mm-hmm. to be part of Syria, but it was meant as an insult, like mm-hmm. yani into Masuria. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I remember, you know, my husband is Christian. I'm a Muslim. So mm-hmm. we, we, were, we were together for a long, long time. We grew up together. And that says something about Tripoli, yeah? that we grew up together, that yeah. isn't available in all, you know, like, why don't you show this about Tripoli, right? Yeah, yeah. We grew up together and we, wallahi, we, genuinely, I went out with him. We started dating when we were 13. It took us like about a year and a half to realize that we were from two different religions. Mm-hmm. Like, we didn't give a fuck, you know? So that doesn't mean that our parents didn't have issues, mind you, but like, there was this secular jaw in, in, in my Tripoli, in the Tripoli I grew up in. Anyways, and then, you know, when we were at university, he went to a university in Jbel, in Biblos, Biblos, and there was this group of friends of his that they never said it, but it was very, very obvious. They, I was the other for them. Yeah. Uh, it was very, very obvious that they could not wrap their he- heads around why would he date A, a Muslim, mm-hmm. B, from Tripoli, يعني ولا حتى from Beirut, a Muslim from <laughs> Tripoli come in, you know? And C, a fat person, because I was, I was much fatter at the time. Okay. So I was the other in those three rounds. يعني I felt it, I felt it, والله, even if they never said it, you know? In my body, I was the fat Muslim girl from Tripoli, and they could not conceive why he would, he would love me, why he would fall in love with me. And uh, I want to add that this othering did not stop in the revolution. No, and I don't no. want, and yes, and, I, and by the way, this is not to say that the feelings that we were feeling back then, that we were saying there's unity, you know, we were all realizing how unified we are. I'm not saying that uh, 
it's not okay to have said that. It's absolutely okay to be absolutely extremely emotional and maybe even naive mm -hmm. in a revolutionary moment. That's mm -hmm. absolutely fine. I'm not like uh, shitting on people who say that because I said that, you know, but reflecting on it, okay, reflecting on it. Now, I know for a fact that this, even on the streets of the revolution was still there because when I went home for Christmas, there was a person who will not be named, and I really, I really doubt that he he listens to the fire these times. So that's <laughs> fine. I could, I could like, uh, yeah, fuck you, whatever. Uh, that person, we were sitting. It was a Christmas gathering, and he was he was in the protests, and mm -hmm. uh, he was saying we were tear gassed, and we ran. That was in December when there was the tear gas starting, and we ran to Betty Kateb mm -hmm. and uh, and then there we there I was you know stuck in this like parking lot and I looked around me and there was all these people from Tripoli look yeah, I, mean, I was there right in front of him he said it there were all these people from Tripoli it said uh, as I, if, was, you know, he, I was there I was there at that moment uh, yeah. to give some context sorry quickly to give some yes. context to others yes uh, so Beit al kataib is basically the Kataib, so the Falange's headquarters which is in downtown Beirut and it just became this uh, hot spot in a sense just because of its location and mm. what ended up happening is that a lot of the time when people were being tear gassed the only door that is literally open that you can avoid the tear gas and always not always yeah. is basically to go in now, obviously, yeah. the party would take advantage of this and do a lot of lots PR for itself. But mm -hmm. that specific night, um, there were indeed uh, protesters that came that came from Tripoli to support protesters in Beirut because there was this momentum going on, especially between Beirut and Tripoli. Mm -hmm. And that's when there was a, in a sense, a crowding of people. I wasn't in the Kateba; I had managed to to left to leave beforehand, before mm -hmm. the the shower of tear gas kind of stuck us in, in a, uh, sorry, uh, put us in a certain place. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so at the, basically at that point, there was within the bait of the Kataib, a lot of people from Beirut and a lot of people from Tripoli. And I'm guessing yes, your, friend, what, your friend was in that, yes. uh, in that, in that spot. Yes. Yeah. And by the way, when I said, yeah, I, mean, I, I, am, I am there, I don't mean that I was there. I wasn't in Lebanon. Uh, I mean that I'm here right in front of you. You are yes, saying yes. it to my face, Yani. Yes. Uh, that, that they were these people from Tripoli who are, of course, not as refined as you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I went home and I fought with him in my head, of course, because I didn't fight with him in front of the entire, you know, people gathering very festively <laughs> for Christmas. <laughs> uh, I, and, uh, you know, I, I kind of regret that I didn't take that moment and completely, completely turn the energy the other way around and sort of say my mind. I regret that. I really do. But sometimes you're in these situations and you're just speechless. And Marwan was there and I went back and I sort of fought with Marwan. I was like, why didn't I say anything? Why did I say anything? Why the fuck did I say it? You know? And, but this is to say, this is to say that, um, yeah, the, the, the sentiment was there even with people protesting and being tear cast. The sentiment was still there. Okay. And I, I, want to, I want to say something. I do not begrudge him feeling that. Not at all. I don't. What I, what I begrudge him is because we are, we are socialized into fearing each other. Okay. Sure, so yeah. I don't hold it against him. I really genuinely do not hold it against him that he was at this moment. He looked around, he saw all these people from Tripoli and he was scared. I don't. What I hold against him is type after all that's been happening for the past few months, why didn't you undo that? Why didn't you start to unlearn that? And, and, and this is why I'm bringing up all this uh, negative thing, negative, negative experiences, not just to say, oh yeah, people say shitty things about Tripolitans, no, but to say that if we do not acknowledge that these feelings exist, we will never be able to transform them because they don't exist, right? So if you're going in the street saying, hey, there's no difference between us, we're all the same, I love you, you love me, whatever, uh, you're not doing anything. Uh, whereas if you acknowledge that you felt uncomfortable, actually you felt uncomfortable with all these uh, people from a different uh, city that, you know, in your environment, you learned was demonized, you know, across the years. And then you go back and you say, why did I feel this way? And you unlearn it. This is where real change happens. Yeah. It's in acknowledging 
that, yeah, you were wrong about shit, and now how can I uh, right that wrong? Yeah. And I've had experiences in my life where that wrong was right, righted as well. And I, 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 I want to tell you another episode and then sort of go back to your experience as someone from Mount Lebanon as well, mm-hmm. because I have a very close friend from Mount Lebanon that I met in AUB, and we were working in the theater together, and I really love him. He's a close friend, and... Um, when I first met him, so we, we kind of hung out uh, a lot, and there was this moment that is really ingrained in my memory where we were sitting at College Hall, okay? And he looked at me, and he said, you know, Zena, uh, growing up uh, from where I am, uh, I never really knew a Muslim person, never had Muslim friends before you. Mm-hmm. And I wonder, like, like yeah like you're okay you know like you're you know like we're okay and it wasn't like it wasn't like yeah and oh my god muslims are okay and they wear short skirts it wasn't that it was a genuine moment of transformation where he revised revised what he has been taught and it's not his fault that he has been taught this it's absolutely not his fault but it is his fault if after you know, seeing what he saw and learning what he learned, that he didn't undo it and he kept thinking in that way of thinking. And that's where, that's where the transformation. And another, another fact that I, I relate to in my own life is that, you know, I am, I am Muslim, my husband is Christian, mm-hmm. we grew up together in, uh, you know, the lycée uh, in, in Tripoli. Uh, and I don't think we get any credit for f- just falling in love with each other because, yeah, and you've done nothing if you just like fell in love with someone from a different religion. Exactly. You just fell in love. You can't help it. All right. So this is not where the real change happens. And wallah, I fell in love because I know a lot of people who fell in love with people from different religions and they couldn't break that wall. They couldn't. They, they broke it off and they went on and married people from different religions. And someone, sometimes I wonder that if I had given in and married a Muslim, would I have had completely different thoughts in terms of religion and politics and whatever than, than the thoughts mm. I have now? You know? So it's not that in Wallah Zena is in, inherently brilliant, yani, wallah, and above you know, being indoctrinated. It's that you know, it so happens that I fell in love with a Christian and that we decided together to cross that, to, to acknowledge there are differences, to acknowledge that we feel uncomfortable about certain things and to talk this shit out and to transform and to really like get into, okay, no, so now how are we going to get our kids out of this fucking cycle? And, and this is how transformation happens, you know? Um, so I want to answer, I want to answer the second part of your question about Tripoli, like what mm-hmm. I felt during the revolution mm-hmm. uh, in terms of the depiction of Tripoli. But I wanted to ask you of someone from Mount Temple, like how was Tripoli depicted, if it was at all to you? Oh, it was, of course. <laughs> it's it's a very similar to what your friend said. Uh, I can literally tell you when's the first time, who, is, who was my first Muslim friend? And her mm. name is Marwa, and she and we were. Yeah. Uh, so I I would have been 15 and a half. That was that mm. would have been the first time in my life, and the only reason that happened is because she was the uh, only non or not probably not only, but like one of the few non Christians in the in the in the Catholic school that I was I was uh, in. The, the, I did not go to Elise. I went to Elise uh, the third time around before starting AUB. But mm-hmm. so. I had a more of a transition in a sense before university for many people from from Mount Lebanon. The transition mm-hmm. is uh, where well, they go to university probably and in university there's just more people and then from more places and that's when they start yes. uh, making friends from elsewhere or whatever. In mm-hmm. my case, it was just like a bit before because I already did Lycée and Lycée was more secular, had more uh, people from, um, uh, uh, I shouldn't say Lycée, it wasn't officially Lycée, but it was a laic system, a, a secular system. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, Growing up, there was uh, a lot of negative associations, not with uh, Tripoli uh, people, Tripolitans themselves, but with the whole, uh, oh, you're almost part of Syria thing that you mentioned before. So yeah. there was this, uh, I mean, I'm, as obviously you know this, the calling someone from Homs is an insult, you know, someone who's mm-hmm. Homse. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I later learned that Syrians themselves do this as well, actually. Uh, but I, I didn't know this at the time. Uh, and I didn't even, so I didn't even know 
what Hamse meant other than the negative connotation that it had. So for me, yeah. it was the negative, it was, uh, for those who don't know, Hamse meant someone at the time who's stupid. That, that was, the, that was yeah, the insult yeah. that you would give people. I did not yeah. actually know it meant someone who is from Homs. I did not know this until like at some point, I probably like when I was 17 or 18 or something. So mm. my up, upbringing was more, um, I'm, I'm struggling to call it innocent because it's, it's not really innocent. But mm. there wasn't a, um, and the homestay thing that I mentioned was in school, it wasn't at home. But mm. for me growing up at home, my, my mom, my grandma, my, okay, my grandma's a different thing, let's put it aside. But with my mom, mm -hmm. it was more, uh, Lebanon is this place, um, I won't tell you much about the civil war, it's too complicated, there's lots of trauma going on. So basically mm -hmm. I grew up not knowing anything about the past of Lebanon. I discovered yeah, all me of too. these names yeah. of, uh, when I discovered who Jaja was and On was when Jaja was released and On came back. That's that's when I discovered who they were. Mm, uh, yes, Nasrallah yeah. and Hariri and all of these names, pretty much all in 2005. That like a crash course of Lebanese history at once. Mm, and mm, mm. so for me, people from Tripoli, people from the South, people from the Ba'a, even people from Beirut, because Beirut was not my city growing up at all. It was, yeah. I, I did not know much about it. Uh, was like, oh, well, you know, uh, kind of like this innocent curiosity, like this puppy uh, discovering the world in a sense kind of thing. Yeah. But yeah. it's later on that I had to deconstruct that even in this quote unquote innocence, there were these uh, associations, these whispers of stereotypes that are not necessarily said out loud. But mm. you would see mm. it when, uh, in the case of Mount Lebanon, when, when so I mean, I'm, I'm, st I'm generalizing way too much here. But in the context of where I grew up in a middle class, uh, working class, middle class area, uh, when someone who is non-Lebanese would come to your house, it's either a migrant domestic worker or a migrant mm. worker, right? So an Ethiopian mm. woman, Filipino woman, whatever, or mm. a usually a Syrian man, a Syrian worker, sometimes Palestinian worker as well. And so mm -hmm. that would be the, the contact, quote unquote, with quote unquote, the other at first the other, yeah and yeah. so if you are in theory the way i would see it is that it's not just a matter of someone who is from mount lebanon meeting someone who's from tripoli or that thing because that stays within the lebanese story in a sense there's also the class uh, dividend obviously that's a massive thing i had yes. uh, middle class friends from tripoli who were acting exactly the exact same way that middle class friends from mount lebanon were acting there was yes. the same stereotypes was syrian same hatred same xenophobia same all of these things Probably yes. with some different, you know, variants of it. Like it might be stronger on something somewhere or whatever. But like the problem was still there, and so yeah, that's how that's how I that that's the Mount Lebanon uh, aspect of it, if you want. Yeah. So that's yeah, and I definitely yeah. Yeah. Sorry. No, I definitely I definitely never felt that Beirut was my city. Like this is my issue with Beirut is that I love it so much yeah. and I feel that it 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 doesn't give a shit about me. Yeah. Uh, and that, and that might be because I'm from Tripoli, but that might also be Beirut for everyone. I don't know. It never felt like it was my city, but I love it. Uh and I definitely grew up not knowing anything about uh, uh the south as well, you know? Like uh so yeah yeah you, you were gonna say i'm sorry you were saying no something. no no so i was transitioning uh somewhat awkwardly to the second part of like the romanticization of tripoli the oh, most oh yeah, october yeah, yeah. stuff of uh oh, so my God. for those who don't know yeah. i mean no you'll just you'll just talk about it so feel free to contextualize yeah. it at the same time yeah 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 so uh so the context is that uh you know uh all of a sudden, I think, I don't know, the, the, first, the first time, I think it was maybe the third day or something, I was looking at my Instagram feed and I saw this like massive crowd dancing to a DJ who I would later on uh, know was DJ Maddie, who became like famous. Yes. Uh, dancing, like, like literally dancing with their like phone lights on. And I was like, oh my God, where, where is that? And I didn't, I didn't recognize Sihta Noor because there wasn't like the word Allah wasn't there in the video. Yeah, it wasn't and video. it took, yeah, it, it took me a while to then read the captions and uh, recognize that, oh my God, this is Trablos, you know? And I was shocked. I was shocked. I was really shocked. And uh, it was such beautiful footage, massive, massive, uh, amount of people just dancing and it went like as you said it went on and on for weeks and, and months and uh, my shock wasn't the shock of yeah I didn't expect that from Tripoli 
my shock was, well, A, all these people in the streets, because it was like really early on in the, uh, in the revolution. And B, it was the fact that I never expected this to come out of Beirut. So it was about the decentralization of the revolution. It was about the fact that the revolution was becoming decentralized and that meant a lot to me. Not just in terms of Tripoli, but also in terms of southern uh, towns and villages and cities as well, right? So the shock was that there was, yeah, that the revolution was decentralized and that was very, very, very important for me. Now, Soon after this, after all this like amazing footage was like invading social media from Tripoli, people started calling Tripoli the bride of the revolution, mm -hmm. which I utterly hated. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I, I hated that. And I know it comes from a good place. Like, again, I'm not sure, against sure. you if you said that. I, it, it comes from a good place. But I hate it for many reasons. You are personifying Tripoli right? The city. You are personifying her as a woman. And what is the best thing a woman can be? What is the best thing we can be? Arus. Yes, okay. yani arus. Yani. I, I, come on. I was never interested in, I'm a woman, like I never wore this goddamn, white. I have nothing against the white dress, but I, I didn't want to wear it. I didn't want to do this whole shit. And it wasn't like me being a arus that was the most cathartic experience of my whole life. All right. It was just like we signed the paper, walked out. Okay, now we're married. Now next. What? Well, now what? So, why? You know, why this sexist, patriarchal, racist terminology? That was my first issue. My second issue was uh, go what you described, which is going from utterly demonizing Tripoli to utterly idealizing Tripoli. You know that nothing wrong can go in Tripoli that oh my god everyone's so nice and we went there and we ate kake and people kept repeating <laughs> the people you know the people are so good the people I mean, why wouldn't the people be good yani, what, yani, I don't get it you know and and there are assholes also in Tripoli like so you sure. know news news flash you know there's also assholes and there's also sure. like a lot of shit that needs to be done so I, I had a problem with that. that it, Tripoli is a very complex city. My relationship with it is very complex. Uh, I think I wasn't able to be my full self in Tripoli. I was more able to be my full self in Beirut. Definitely, mm -hmm. I would be lying if I told you otherwise. But also it's a city that has childhood memories, that has a lot of tenderness, uh, that is home. That is also home uh, to me. And when I went in December to Sihta Noor, uh, on Sihta Noor, uh, on this big wall, uh, it's written, Trablos Jannat Lubnan. Yes. I don't know about you, but if you were inviting me into your own house while at the same time telling me, Don't worry, you're going to be safe in my house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go into that house. <laughs> Why? Why Of course, again, I realize how do I realize where all of this is coming from. It's like this overcompensation. Exactly, the city want to exactly. overcompensate and say, "Come, come to us. We are safe. We are safe." But it's kind of creepy too. So, so just just be you. Just be you. And uh, we need again. We need more complicated conversations. We need more complicated conversations. We need to acknowledge that that Tripoli is also a city that has a lot of shit going on that we need to undo. Let me quickly say. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was also a, 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 it's not, again, it's not justification for it, but I sort of understood where that need to overcompensate also came from at the time, because, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I linked it and I, I have a number of screenshots and links for those who, who want to see the extent of what we're talking about here, of when, what we mean when we mean by scapegoating, because mm -hmm. there were, um, OTV obviously was doing this quite a lot. OTV is the, is the, for those who don't know, is the channel associated with the current president's political party. Very, very lovely TV station. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they were constantly, constantly making shit up about Tripoli. And they were doing this in the same breath, like in the same uh, language, that the same uh, scapegoating that they would do against Syrians. And that, that's where the whole connotation happens all the time as well. But when mm -hmm. the fires were happening in the week before uh, the revolution happened, one of the triggers of the actual of the revolution, there were, uh, and I know you know this, for those who don't know, there were people who were going on OTV, including Marion, a, a Lebanese MP, um, saying stuff like, you know, these, were, these fires were created by Syrians 
and, oh my God. and uh, oh my Syrians God, were yes, going yes. into these houses to whatever. Yeah, and then yeah. that just, they got bored of Syrians. And then within a week or two weeks, uh, you know, there was Tripoli there. Let's, let's do the exact same, use the exact same words towards Tripoli. Mm-hmm. And they were saying things like fighters were coming in from Idlib towards Tripoli. And so many Dear things God. like the, the connotation, the, the, it's not even like an undertone of it. It's like an overtone of it. It's so obvious what you guys are trying to say. You're, you're, and, you know, and there were people on TV, like supporters of, of some of the sectarian parties who were going on TVs and saying, oh, these people are coming from Tripoli, Kilhole Daesh, like all of these people are from ISIS. Like oh, these, yeah. these things were said on national television constantly. So I understand mm-hmm. where the the need in a sense to overcompensate. No, no, we're very nice. Please come here. Don't yeah. worry. Uh, here's yeah. some packet, you know, here's some, you know, yeah. like all of these things. <laughs> I understand where it comes from, but it's so, so depressing that this is even needed in the first place. Yeah, no, there are, there are people, there are people in my close circle who still think this of Tripoli. Yani, yes. And, and, and they're, they're not bad people. That's the thing. There are people I love who say this about P- Tripoli. And it's, it's this fear mongering. It's this fear, this fear that they plant into us, you know, that, that, that the media, the everything. And, and this is why we have, again, the real revolution is in the mind. The real revolution is how we undo all this, you know, how we unlearn all this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hello. So you, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, you're sorry. Still <laughs> you had, the, you know, so I was uh, falling silent because you had the story that you wanted to mention. It's about Tripoli. It's like, I have so many stories about Tripoli. Like you opened the, the floodgates, but yeah, floodgates. like the, 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 and it's also a story of like, also like coming together. It's a positive one, you know, like uh, one of my best friends now uh, is, is from the South, but she grew up in, uh, in Beirut. Her name is Huda. And I had just met her at mm-hmm. AUB. I had just met her. And if you remember outside of AUB, <laughs> there's a bookstore called Malik. Yes. Malik's bookstore. <laughs> So uh, she was walking away from me. So she was like, I don't know, 10, 10 meters away from me, kind of. And she's like, see you, see you, th- see you outside. And we were standing in front of West Hall. And it was a time where West Hall was very, very, very clouded. Lots and lots of people between us. And I projected into that, you know, space. And I told Huda, okay, خلاص. بشوفك عند Malik. <laughs> And I said Malik, you know, and she, instead of Malik, and Huda froze. She completely froze. (laughs) And, and she, she was like, did you just say Malik? She went up to me again. She like, she approached, she's like, did you just say Malik? And I'm like, hey, Malik. And and we started laughing, you know, we started laughing. And so when the, when the Thawra started, there was a meme or a joke or whatever that I received on WhatsApp that said, you know, speaking of like how, you know, famous Tripoli was during the revolution, that we will all now start saying Wahid instead of Wahid. Right, yeah, yeah, I saw this. Yeah, yeah. And I sent it, and I sent it to Huda, and I told her, just so you know, that Malik was the right way to say it. <laughs> all along. And, and she laughed, and she's like, yes, yes, of course, Wahid, Malik, you know, this is, this is the right way to say things. So, you know, this, it's just, a, it's a funny story, but sometimes humor, like, says, says also. Uh, it does, stuff, it does. You know. And, you know, um, well, um, Oh yeah, so let me, I'll say something quickly. Uh, one of the things that most surprises uh, non-Lebanese friends is how, like, basically. So I'll just speak for myself, of course. But with all of my friends from Lebanon, or most of them anyway, they're from pretty much everywhere. There's, you know, uh, we have these jokes. You know, this guy is the Shia from the south, and this one is the Sunni from the north, and this one is yeah. the whatever. Yeah, from, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we, we have these uh, essentially sectarian jokes, and that's the only way we manage to to, 100%, to yes. uh, mock it, to undermine it, to try and downplay its toxicity in a sense, because with my parents, uh, well, I won't, I won't speak too much in detail, but there are certain tendencies or certain habits that are still there. There was a, um, when there were more people coming down from Tripoli, there was a specific phenomenon happening of people from Beirut going back up and people from Tripoli going back down. But at some point, because so much was happening in Beirut, the, the parliament meetings, you know, that kind of stuff, and we're trying to stop them and all of these things, there was more of a, uh, more of a let's say, one-way drive than the other way drive at some point. That was like a period of mm. two weeks or so. And yes, so yes. Uh, we were being um, targeted, literally, from, on, on the one side from the Shabiha and then from the security forces and then from the whatever, and then we were mm. stuck. And so that one yes. of the... Um, 
uh, I mean, it, it, ends, it ended up being sort of a joke in a sense, but we, need, we needed the Shabebi to trouble us. Like, that's what they were being called. The people were, I, I yeah. wasn't calling them that, but that's what they were being yeah. called. The guys, the, yeah. the youth, the young men from Trablos specifically. Yeah, yeah. And because they were our, uh, so, so to speak, our defenses. That we were here and there were people, I'm making gestures that you can't even see anyway. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, you were here, they were in front of us and we we're behind. And so there was this thing that was in Sanisa needed. And so this was all being filmed on TV. Uh, I don't remember, LBC, I just did one of those. And I went back home after that exhausted like filled with tear gas and like malish lady like I, I was unable to have a nuanced conversation with you today mom <laughs> that, that that was the, yeah. the, the, yeah. the, the, the <laughs> my mood if you want oh, and so yeah. she said something she didn't say it too directly but she said something like um like be careful about those like you know how it's yeah it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 uh and I, I was, as I said, like, uh, excuse me for the, for the, for the language, but like, I hear it, my, I was unable to, <laughs> I was unable to, I couldn't say, mom, these are stereotypes. We have to think about these things. Let's be more nuanced. This is, I know I said, I started yelling. It was not good. And then I ended up, we fixed it. You know, I, I said, I'm sorry. Yeah. Know? But there's a lot of emotional baggage, obviously when, especially when it's intergenerational trauma and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, no, I had similar. I had a similar. I had a similar thing with my mother-in-law where I didn't yell, but uh, uh, she kind of said something like, "Where? Why don't they just protest in their city?" Right. Yes. And, I heard that a lot uh, as well. And I told her, "Beirut is my city." Yes. Beirut is my city. And no, شو يعني أنا I'm from Trablos. هلا you're gonna tell me in Zali بس عسحت النور. Don't go to سحت الشهداء. Exactly. But it's also a class thing, you see, because yes. someone like me, and no, you can go protest the Martha's Square, you're not threatening. It's okay, I'm middle class, I'm harmless, I'm, you know, it's also a class thing. I, it's also that they mean a particular kind of class, you know, Absolutely. lower Absolutely. income people who, who we learn to be afraid of. And of course, in any public situation, when, we're, when you're with like thousands and thousands of people, you're going to be careful anyway but mm -hmm. uh, i wasn't there i wasn't there where with the tear gas i was i went there in november when it was sort of ha high and i have i have i have a, a fear i have a real fear of spaces where there's lots of people uh, mm -hmm. and uh, but but i did not feel for a second that i was not safe uh, but that might have shifted in later events that might have shifted when the tear gas started so i understand that as your mom she wants to tell you in in general like be careful in general sure absolutely uh, you know but but yeah we have to unlearn so so much so many things we have to unlearn so many things really uh there's yeah. a lot there's a lot there and uh so and there's me... a lot in the humor i can i comment on the humor and that course, would be the last course, thing i said of course of course there's a, a lot of people who aren't Lebanese don't understand how inappropriate the humor is yes. and how actually and how actually sectarian the humor yes. is. During the Thawra, one of the groups that were that we grew up with, the Lycée group, uh, our, our uh, friends from Lycée, uh, at some stage, you know, Marwan was commenting something and someone was like, يعني Marwan, خلص, didn't you become a Sunni now? You've been married to Zena all this time. <laughs> And uh, Marwan was like, la, 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 Allah room. You know, of course, he doesn't mean any of this shit, you know? Uh, la, 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 Allah room. And then I commented like, uh, you know, Zawji wahad minnon, you know, killon yani killon. And I said, we don't mean any of this. And it's, it's a humorous way to actually, yeah, like you said, exactly what you said, to, to undo uh, all of this. Yeah. If we can make jokes about it so openly, it's no longer threatening. One of the, yeah. one of the, humor like the the role of humor in this um uh situation is that when if i make a joke about shias to my shia friend that mm. means that we are comfortable enough that we are able yes. to be just friends and yes. i make the exact same jokes if not much worse jokes about maronites my my quote unquote community it's yeah, all of these yeah. it's all of these jokes uh, okay so on a final note and you know this has been a long and honestly very productive and fun conversation um what are some of your uh let's put it this way what are some of the things you're looking forward to in the sense of if we're talking about a shift as we mentioned before between being able to read and write poetry to struggling with it and then going to pose and then trying to come all of these things what are some of the future developments that you kind of feel, and by future I'm talking like tomorrow, you know, don't worry. It's not like 10 years from now. 
what are some of the the things that you feel you you are uh, ready or like willing to get into in the let's say in the short term future? Um, honestly, I don't think I'm ready to get into any kind of writing right now. I think mm -hmm. uh, probably I will spend a lot more time thinking and uh, reading mm -hmm. and uh, trusting that writing will will sort of come. I mean, I do have a third poetry collection that's almost done. So I want to, I want to dive back into that and shape it. But what I would want is I would want for myself to have more peace. I don't think I'm in a peaceful state of mind right now. I, I, would, I would want to quiet my mind a little bit. I think there's too much happening, too much, too much happening. Or maybe, you know, I all of a sudden realize that there is too much happening. I don't know. Yeah, I think, uh, that, I think I, that it is a generalized feeling, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I look forward to having some quiet in my mind, honestly. I hope to be able to tap into poetry, of course, to go back to it. Uh, there's, a quote, there, there's a quote by uh, the poet Mina Alexander, and she says, we have poetry, so we do not die of history. And I love that quote. Mm. Uh, because, yeah, uh, I mean, that's another, I'm not going to discuss it any more further. But yeah, I hope to be able to dive back into that as well. And can you tell us very quickly uh, to finish off, uh, what, is the, what is the prose that you're going to read? Yeah, so this is, this is a small excerpt of the journaling that I was do, do, doing during like the first wave of, of the Thaura. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I just chose a day, I chose not even the whole day, like a part of the day where I am talking to my friend on the phone and sort of processing. Awesome, Zena. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, Joey. Thank you. So thank you for listening. And we will finish off this episode with Zena's recording. Thank you. Leila calls, asks if I'll be in Dubai for Christmas. I say yes, most probably, though we're thinking of going to Lebanon. She's staying in Dubai, she says, and inviting herself to my house for Christmas. It's become a tradition for Marwan and I to have some friends and their families over for Christmas Eve. And Leila, who's usually in Lebanon around that time, has decided to stay in Dubai this year. Her mother passed away in March. Akid, I reply, my house is your house. After we chat a little bit, Leila starts choking up. I feel I have no one in this world. Of course you have people, and I'm one of them. I don't know the loneliness of losing both parents, but I know this sense of desertion. When we moved to Saudi, when we moved to Bahrain, didn't I feel alone in the world there? Dubai has been kinder, with more friends and more freedom as my children get older, but am I not always terrified at the thought of my closest friends leaving? Those who are always on the move are perhaps more aware of the ephemerality of houses, balconies, dinners with friends, dances, laughter. Everything is always shifting, changing. My kids keep saying goodbye to neighbors and school friends, whereas I had the stability, even in a civil war, of growing up with mine. This April, I was upset to learn my children's pediatrician was leaving the clinic. I still remember the pediatrician I went to in Tripoli, his crowded clinic, the sliding wooden and glass door, his gray hair and beard, the reflex hammer with which he tapped my knees. We are those who keep building homes as we go. My panic in 2012 when we moved to Dubai was because it was the first time since I'd left Lebanon that I felt almost at home. I managed to make friends, connected with people who love poetry, drove a goddamn car, began to have regular cafe corners, and once I realized the joy of all this, I was afraid to lose it again. I used to stand in my girl's bedroom as they slept and pray to God we don't move again. Not even to Lebanon, which became emptier and emptier of friends every year. I was tired of beginning. Beginnings meant less the excitement of the possible and more the loss of the comforting familiar. It matters so much to be able to call a friend and tell them you're coming over for Christmas. And yet, don't I know in my heart that Dubai is not enough? that I've perhaps already started to leave. I tell Leila that Rana and I might go to Lebanon this weekend, 
I might also go with her for a few days in December when she's due for her routine multiple sclerosis tests in Beirut. This way, I'd get to be with her and I'd also get to be inside the Thawra again. But Zena, Leila says, even if you go, even if you keep going, you're not inside the revolution. Thank you.